Brother Caleb is at uh, the Wilds, still um, working there for n the next four weeks, I believe. The thing about the, when Caleb's time is done, done at camp, that means the summer is over. Well, this Wednesday night is something special. We're going to do some special things for the boys and girls, young people, or anybody who wants to participate. Here's what it is. Wednesday night, start coming to be here at church about 6.15 if you can. I moved it to 6.30 so the folks would have an opportunity to get off work a little bit. Here at church, we're going to have dinner in the fellowship hall. Now, it's not going to be a fancy dinner. At best, it's going to be fish sticks and chicken sticks and corn dogs. And we're going to try and have that dinner here at the church, 6.30, our, our little Bible, vacation Bible school lesson on fishers of men, and then we're taking everyone down to the Setzer's house for a fishing tournament. So I've been to Walmart, got all my fishing stuff ready. I've got about 12 to 15 poles. I could, we could use more. If not, we're going to have to do it in fishing teams, like one fishes and another watches, but... If you can come and bring a fishing pole, has a little hook on it and a bobber or float on it, and help out, that'd be a big help. Something easy that, you know, we can throw it, throw it out there and some kids, kids can use it. Uh, I want kids to come because we're going to have a prize for the biggest fish. We're going to have a prize for the most fish. Uh, then we're going to have uh, several prizes for who catches fish number 7 and who catches fish number 11 and who catches fish number 20. So... We're going to have a, a prize table for kids for our fishing tournament. So probably going to run about 45 minutes. Hopefully the fish will cooperate and the weather will cooperate. And there will be enough adults to help cooperate because it sure need people to help take it off the hook and stuff like that, bait the hook. So no one go, we'll let everyone bait up their hook. We'll blow a whistle. We'll start the fishing tournament. And it should be a lot of fun around ponds, so like that, neighbors, so like that, helping if I could... Everyone's invited to come. 6.30 here at the church. Got to get dinner started right away. And then we'll be down there from about uh, 7, 7.15 to 8, 8.15 will be a, the tournament. A very distinct time because we're going to have a last fish, too, at the whistle. So uh, the last fish caught prize like that. I think kids won't come. Got some nice, going to have some nice nice little awards there for whoever, for what they catch and so like that. So. If you can help out, that'd be Wednesday night. Next Sunday, it is next Sunday, isn't it? Uh, where's Tammy or Jessica? Someone can help me on this. Does anybody know about the the water park at Pipes? Is that the seventh, August seventh? Um, morning services, and then um, the afternoon service. After the afternoon service, a picnic lunch here at the church, so we can get it all in. Then we're heading out. We have the times from 3 to 6 o'clock at Pipestem State Park, the water, uh, what do they call it down there, with all the inflatables and stuff like that, the water park part. Uh, we're asking young folks, wear some old cut-off jeans, a T-shirt, stuff like that. It's not a day to look fashionable. It's a day to be modest and have a lot of fun at the water, you know, like that. So um, to dress like that. Um, if you want to stay later than that at the park, you're more than welcome to do that, whatever you'd like to do, adults, if you want to take high. But if enough adults go down the water park, if you have a family to be down there, that's good. Um, that'll be from 3 to 6 o'clock. I realize that if you don't plan and do special things, they don't get done. You know, you, you just got to plan them and do them. And sometimes they take a little work and... This should be a lot of fun as we close out the summer. Basically, after that, I think young folks are heading back to, you know, volleyball camps and soccer camps and soccer seat. Different things all get started for schools and things like that. Wednesday night, Lord willing, going back to the Bible study lesson, Joseph, a type of Christ. How about Joseph and the Antichrist? Something maybe not even consider. How, in a time of crisis, how does a government completely take over all the rights, money, of, of, and everything of the people? So there's something else in the story of Joseph that ought to be considered about and, uh, and prophetically about the Lord's return. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, uh, Brother Burks, the new director that took over for Jimmy Jones at Cherith Bible Institute, 
is going to set up a display so you can see some of the Bible studies that are offered. Uh, you can get a certified Bible, uh, Bible cert, uh, diploma through Cherith now as they've worked with ABC and uh, the state and so like that. And you can get a one or two year Bible degree through Cherith Bible Institute. Uh, the lessons are, they're really, really good. And it might be something someone would want to consider through the year to maybe just one book. Maybe you want to do the book of Revelation. Maybe you want to do a book of Isaiah or something like that. Uh, Brother Burks will present that next Sunday morning here at the church and he'll be speaking for us. He pastored for 37 years, seven years in Welch, and then 30 years in Crow. And uh, he got a lot of experience. I, he reminds you a lot of Jimmy Jones. You can see why he took over the Cherith Bible Institute. Very personal, very experienced. Uh, so I, I think you'll enjoy that. Next Sunday morning will be that presentation from them folks. Two messages that are working together here today. The simple title for both is So Close. So Close. The emphasis on this morning's message will be missing the golden opportunity. The second message will be witnessing. Oh, let's see if I have it, get exactly if I had it in the bulletin. Witnessing the glorious appearing. Since the question will be asked a lot of times, do you think that we're close to the Lord's return? I want to share a few things that right out of the pages of the current events today and some scriptures, a scripture presentation, the why and when Jesus said, if you see these things, lift up your eyes, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, That'll be our second service this morning. Turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm going to take it, Abby and Beth, you're not all coming up to sing for us. Is that a definite no? Okay. I, you just said yes. Yeah, okay. Deuteronomy 30, we'll read verses 11. Through 16. Follow along in verse 11. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest, thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven? And bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in, in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So close, yet missing a golden opportunity. I was saying a week or so ago that someday the last soul will be saved. Somewhere, someplace, sometime in this Gentile age, in this age of the church, the last person is going to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. I said in that service, that message, what a testimony in heaven for someone to say for all the testament for all the ages to come, I was the last one who made it in. Some children's church somewhere. Well, if we went to the eastern direction, they're what twelve hours ahead of us. We go the other way; they're twelve hours behind us. You know, in proximity and time like that. Some people's days are already half over. We went over towards Europe. 
Some are about half, are just getting, not even started yet. But in the proximity of this, uh, this calendar day, it's possible, maybe in a Philippine island, maybe our missionary in Gambia, maybe uh, Jennifer Andrews in Liechtenstein, maybe Michelle Geiger down in Uganda is going to kneel with a child and say, you can invite Jesus in your heart to be saved. And that little child says, dear Jesus, save my soul. And kaboom, God says, that's it. That's the last member of the body of Christ. And the rapture of the church takes place. That's just inco- that's hard to even comprehend, isn't it? And we realize the Lord is waiting and tearing. He's not slack concerning his promises. But he said in 1 Peter or 2 Peter 3, uh, verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. He is waiting and he's tearing his return till the body of Christ is complete. And somebody is going to get in last. I can think of their testimony saying, I was so close to be eternally lost, to eternally saved. Years ago, I cannot remember exactly, I'm thinking it was at Dollywood, and I'm thinking it's when they still had the show called the Bubble World. I realized we were on the other side of the park and we knew that the last show was at four and I'm pretty sure it was there. And we went running across the park, and we got there, and the line was real big, and out the door, and they had letting folks in, and we got up there, and the, the doors actually closed, and the person said, seven more. And the guy went like, one, two, three, and it was us. You know, and, it was, and we, and right, really, the, the two or three people right behind us did not get in. And they opened the door and let us, last seven, he counted out, come in the door bubble world so close cutting it so close to get in or not holy fathers we come to you in prayer help us now this portion of service i pray that your blessings be on what we consider in both services please spirit meet with us we'd ask in jesus name amen looking back in the scriptures The rich young ruler from several weeks ago is in Matthew chapter 19, verse 22. Ask the Lord, what must I do to obtain eternal life? The precedent of that passage is he said, good master. And the Lord said, why callest thou me good? There's only one good, that's God. That standard of righteousness, which you're talking about eternal life in the goodness of God. That is so key in the scriptures when we think of the scriptures. Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is a righteous standard of God that sin misses that mark. Only God makes that mark. But he said, well, how about the keeping of the law? And remember he said, thou shalt not steal uh, uh, on your parents and the, all the commandments the Lord mentioned or, or declared, the man said, check, 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 check. I've done all that from my youth up. What am I yet lacking? And the Lord said, all that thou hast, sell and give to the poor and come and follow me. And he went away sorrowful. Think that through. If he truly wanted eternal life, it's not teaching you can earn it anyways, the standard of God's righteousness. But the Lord knew of all the commandments he mentioned. He did not say, thou shalt not covet. That's the one he didn't say. That's the one he brings up and says, then go sell everything you have and come follow me. If all he needed to do was that moment on to have eternal life, was to give away what he had and follow Jesus, if he really wanted eternal life compared to 70 years of living, or maybe 40 years of good living with good health, or maybe 30, if he really wanted eternal life, would he not have traded that for that? 
But that being said, I'll say this. He went away sorrowful. He was that close, but not saved. That's somewhat repeated in Mark chapter 12, verse 34. When a scribe listens to Jesus' answer of the great commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second commandment's like in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. And a scribe repeats and says, Thou hast well said, For in this the matter of law, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Jesus then replies to that scribe and says, Thou hast answered discreetly, discreetly, prudently, wisely, with some thought. When I looked at the discreetly this morning, circumspectly, knowing what to add or what to leave out. Jesus said, you have very carefully answered what I said and repeated it. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. It is even nigh unto thee. Even in his wise answer and how he thought it through and with his prudent, you know, and knowing, adding into his, and his response, Jesus said, you're close. In Luke chapter 23, Jesus is hung on the cross between two malefactors, two criminals. It is very much as Isaiah chapter 53 in the last verse of the chapter says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. There, stood, there hung Jesus between two criminals. They're both within conversation range of Jesus, they railed on him at the beginning. Then one of them says, wait a minute. And, and responds to the others, don't, don't speak blasphemy against this one in the middle. He's being punished, having done nothing amiss. We're getting what we deserved. Then within earshot, that one says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I don't know exactly what hour of the day and what minute it is into the crucifixion of those thieves. They are right there beside Jesus. Within the next few minutes, maybe within that hour, one of those is going straight to hell. The other one's going to say, I just got in. And this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Can you imagine that for all of eternity, that thief, that criminal is going to say, I'm so glad I was that close to Jesus. I'm so glad that in the last hour of my life, I'm so glad that in the last minute of my life, I got saved. I don't know that any of those can compare to the ones I'm coming to. Maybe it should turn to, if you're close to it, Matthew 26, if you want to look at it. Matthew 26. Verse number 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. We don't have this dialogue in the other gospel accounts, and we don't have it this pointed and this precise in the other uh, gospel accounts. We see that in one gospel account, Judas was irate, and Judas was upset because the woman who took the alabaster box of 300 pence worth and poured it on Jesus not that he cared for the poor, but he was indignant, saying, couldn't this have been sold and given to the poor? We see Judas has this greedy resentment building up in him. But when Jesus tells the disciples, the apostles, that one that's sitting at this table shall be, betray me, 
And the others ask, well, who is it? And in John's account, beckoning to John who leans on Jesus, ask him who it is. It's something that Jesus responds, the one that I dipped the sop with and handed to, that's the one. They don't even recognize that Judas would be such a person that Jesus said, here he is. It's this gospel account that Judas himself, maybe to deflect the glare, maybe to deflect the interest that people are looking at what Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. Judas himself says, is it me? And Jesus said, thou said it. I'm wondering, after nearly three years of public ministry with Jesus Christ, if we was to go through the list of the miracles in a Wednesday night Bible study, you'd see how miraculous the miracles were. If you were in the boat and Jesus walked on the water of the boat, you'd have to be thinking like the rest of them, what manner of man is this? If you saw the gathering of 12 baskets in one occasion, seven baskets full of food in another occasion, where Jesus blessed the food and took five loaves and two fishes and fed 10,000 people, and you were asked as one of them to gather it up, somewhere it would have to cross your mind there's something supernatural about Jesus Christ. If you were outside of Lazarus' tomb, and you witness what the others witness. It was brought back to my mind again this week. I won't go back to it. But the, when I think in earthly senses, the finality of death, I, in the earthly way, without any faith involved to it, you look at it and say, that is so final. That is, that is so sad. That is so tragic. It's, it's such an end, I say, without the faith. If you were at Lazarus' tomb and realized for four days he's been sealed up there and the tomb has been put, he's gone past the embalming processes, his body is set on corruption. If you were there and witnessed Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth. Judas. You'd have to think that Judas would say, I'm trusting Jesus. Did it ever cross in his heart and his mind? I'm telling you, there's something. He's, he's, he's more than just different. He is the Son of God. And yet in the last hour, in the last day of his life, is it me? And he went out, the scripture says, and it was dark or it was night. Knowing knowing he's going to betray Jesus. I do not know what Judas is thinking in the abyss today. But the words so close have to come to mind. I was there. I was right there. I was with in Jesus' presence that he could hand me the biscuit. All I had to do was ask him to save me. I have seen in the scriptures that possessions kept one from calling on Jesus, for he was had much possessions and he went away sorrowful. I see in the scriptures that peers, what people think of you, keep some from coming. When Jesus healed the blind man. Even their own parents weren't going to recognize Jesus because they had heard that whoever did would be thrown out of the synagogue and would not be accepted in the synagogue, in the worship circles, in the social circles. I see that those that went from Lazarus' tomb, but some went back to the Pharisees, some left, and for fear of the Pharisees and others. So the Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. And it's possible. I don't want to jump ahead of myself in the second service, but sometimes it's just old selfish pride. Acts chapter 24. I'm laying a foundation here just for really not that long of a message. Acts 24, verse 27. But... After two years, Portius Festus came into the Felix room, 
and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Two years, Felix, with his household and with his servants, brought in the apostle Paul to reason with him of faith and temperance and judgment to come. And there he heard the apostle Paul. I wonder what folks would think. I really don't know of what speaker I'd bring in that would draw a crowd. If Billy Graham was still alive, I believe if we had him come speak at Kegley Baptist Church, and it was on our sign down there, Billy Graham, Sunday morning, some people would come. <laughs> the days of just putting up a sign, revival doesn't draw people into church anymore. Who... Who could speak that people would say, oh, we've got to come, and we'd have to put up cones and saw horses on the road and have the police department come and cut off and, and sign traffic? What speaker could I get and, and arrange to come that we would have to have crowd control down the streets of Kegley to get people in the church to hear that speaker? Could anybody tell me who? <laughs> Jesus, you think? Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is going to be here on the Wednesday nights throughout the summer, and he's going to speak on the book of Romans. Apostle Paul. Romans. Study, Wednesday night. Do you think I'll have to put up cones to keep people out or get people a place to sit? John. John the Revelator. Like the old Negro spiritual, John the Revelator, John the Revelator. So John the Revelator is going to be here for a Sunday night special teaching the book of Revelation. Well, he said, Brother Rick, can't, can't get them, they're dead. Okay. David Jeremiah is coming. That might bring a few people because of the TV ministry. Chuck Swindoll. Well, I don't know that he's even speaking anymore much. Anyways, Felix had Apostle Paul. Two-year Bible study with the Apostle Paul. We can have not have that privilege. We wouldn't know what it's like to sit down at the table with just two or three and say, now, Paul, explain to me a little bit. Let's go through the book. Let's go through Romans chapter 8. Apostle Paul would say, let's talk about no condemnation. Let's talk about no annihilation. Let's talk about no separation. Let's talk about no miscalculation. For we know that all things work together for good to them. And we'd have the Apostle Paul teaching Romans chapter 8 in that outline. we go, oh, man, we never heard like that. But after two years, because of the fear of what the Jews and fear of his political stance, fear of his, of his friendship, which would come about, and we'll see in another passage with Festus and then with also Agrippa, that he'll leave Paul bound. I, I, I know there's something about this message. Let's turn over a chapter. Acts chapter 26, verse number 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. This is not a message on this entirely, but there's some things in this passage I want you all to consider. Felix, in the process of time, in the two years, has now brought Paul to the, into the court of the next court up. You know, of the, of the procurate, of a, just a regional, like a governor, now up to a king of the region appointed by the Roman Empire. Now here's, in the descendancy of the Herod kings, here's a grip on the throne. He is familiar. He's had his counselors. He's had his advisors bringing in to him the information what's happening throughout the region. He, Paul says this, have you heard of these things? I persuade you've heard of them. These things weren't done in a corner. It was done in your region, under your jurisdiction. You know about the persecution that was taking place of, of the Christians. You know how under authority I was one of the leaders who was able, 
with government authority to commit them to prison or to, or to death. You heard how the chief instigator against Jesus and against the church has now done a 180 and now is going out and preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Herod had all the information he needed of his jurisdiction. He had all the reports. Now he's got the Apostle Paul sitting in front of him telling how Jesus changed his life. And the only thing he could come up with was almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Our hymn book has a song or hymn used a lot of time and a lot in older days in invitation times based on that passage. It's simply entitled Almost Persuaded. Judas could say I took the biscuit from his hand. I kissed him on the cheek in the Garden of Gethsemane. The thief on the cross can say, I was right there beside him. And Felix and Agrippa can say, we sat down and talked with the Apostle Paul for two years about this. And probably... All of them, we might use different phrases and say, almost persuaded. My pastor, Tom Duff, would walk across a platform during invitations, and used that, they used two songs constantly, softly and tenderly in the morning, almost persuaded in Sunday evening. And Tom would walk across there and say, there's a man in hell going almost persuaded, almost persuaded, almost persuaded, almost persuaded. Almost persuaded for all of eternity. So close. Turn with me to, well, you, if you're still in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 30. It's the second giving of the law, and it has the particulars. In this covenant or this agreement God's making with the children of Israel, if they make a decision to keep God's covenant, to live according to this, as he said in the particulars of the law. Look at verse number 7, chapter 30, verse 7. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies... And on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. I'm just going to read one verse for time. But he says, I will fight for you. And every bad thing, I'll bring on your enemies for you. Then if you look at verse number 9. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand. In the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. And like there's examples in times past, and here's one. Abraham was blessed for following the Lord in faith. Jacob, even in the house of Laban. Laban said, I found out with you here, I'm blessed. So they had examples in, the, in their past where God blessed them that fo- the, of his children that followed him. Now he's saying to Moses, saying, here's what God's saying right now. Listen to this. I will make a covenant with thee. If you will walk and keep my commandments, I will rain terror on your enemies. I'll fight for you. And I will bless you exceedingly. How strange... What's about to be said now in that context, it's the text we read. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. I'm not hiding this. I've not made this unreachable. If some of you say, what? It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go up to us uh, 
for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Hey, where is that contract? We'll sign that. Well, if you're going to have that contract where God's going to fight against your enemies and bless you exceedingly, you're going to have to go up and you're going to have to make a left turn at Alpha Centura. You're going to have to go across Orion's Belt. And then you're going to have to end up, you know, in a Quasar Galaxy, so many quarks off. And there God said he'll allow you to sign such a covenant. Wait a minute. Neither is it beyond the sea. <clears throat> I can see where we'd have some trouble going through the heavens. Neither is across the sea. You realize what a barrier the oceans and the seas are. What difficult it is. So we just spent two, the two days at the beach, and the whole time was over there. It's 20, 25 mile an hour winds. The beaches are closed. The red flags are flying. And tragically, I didn't realize just 20 miles down the beach, someone got caught in the tide. But um, boy, the r ocean's rough right now. Like, well, it's like tropical storm rough. I realize that there's no way, you know, unless you're on a big ocean liner and a massive yacht, there's no way you're getting a boat out there, if you have any sense at all. Neither is beyond the sea, that thou shouldest say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. <clears throat> go get the particulars of that contract. Well, where's it at? Well, God's going to fight for you against your enemies, and he's going to bless you exceedingly. But you're going to have to agree this contact where? Way out there. Oh, my goodness. I can't get that. Even if I wanted to, I can't get that. Now you get the idea? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I've set before you this day life and good and death and evil. Do you realize what he says said there? You don't have to go up there to make this agreement. You don't have to go out there to make this agreement. It's right here. It's right here. You can do it where you sit. Get the idea? Wait a minute. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law. You still say by faith, but you had to, for God's blessings and God's protection, you had to live according to that law. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend unto heaven, that is to bring Christ down from heaven or from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? If you like to write in your Bible so you put subject and verb agreement together, and I have a line for what saith it, I have a line up to verse 6, the righteousness which is of faith. What speaketh on this wise? What does the righteousness of faith say? It says, verse 8, The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How close is the faith of righteousness to you and I today? If I go back to this passage, I'm going to say this. I don't have to scale a ladder of righteousness all the way into the stars to obtain it. 
I don't have to catch an ocean freighter and get across the Pacific Ocean, get in a bathoscope and go to the depths of the marina trench to find it. Where is it? It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Amen. Catch this now. How close are you to faith? First of all, think of this. America. Do you think God you're born in America? Do you watch anything at all how you say, oh, Austria, Austria is pretty. It sure is. New Zealand's pretty. Filming of the Lord of the Rings makes me think, man, I'd like to see that island. You know, there's beautiful places all around the world. <clears throat> and you take the regions of the Balkans, and you take, you know, whether it's, you know, Austria or Czechoslovakia or Hungary and other they've known nothing but war for millennia and still today. You think our inflation and you think our gas price, you think ours are high, you ought to try uh, Europe right now. You want to stand in line for an orange? Go to Cuba. Considered medicine. But I'm going back to the gospel sake. The word of faith or the word of righteousness. I mean, we have a heritage of pilgrims. We have a Mayflower compact. We have a heritage of originally of our Ivy League schools and for the witness and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yale University. We have the witness of, my goodness, of Washington in his farewell address. We have the witness of Benjamin Franklin that no nation, if, if, if God and his sovereign knowledge and eyesight takes notice of every sparrow that falls, he, I'm confident that no nation arise without his care. We have the testimony of Noah Webster. We have the testimony well, of Daniel Webster. We have the testimony of Abraham Lincoln. And they talked about the bountiful blessings of God and his favor upon this country. I'm just telling you. America, we have the heritage of, huh, we have the heritage of the Puritans. We have the heritage of Pennsylvania and the city of, Pit, of brotherly love. We have the heritage of Rhode Island and William uh, Rod, uh, Rogers and going in Providence, Rhode Island, that God's goodness allowed us that. We got testimonies on the Liberty Bell of God's goodness to this country everywhere we look. We still have, believe it or not, the Ten Commandments above the Supreme Court. And everywhere you go in America has been the freedom of faith. Churches everywhere. I told you it's coming down 19 one time. I just went ahead and pulled over. I said, I told folks there's a lot of white steeples in Princeton. <laughs> Pulled over and I counted 19. One, two, three, four, my, my. There are churches everywhere. You drive and travel the countryside. I think about it every time I drive through McDowell County. There's a little white closed up church about everywhere. Some closed up, some of them not. At one time, but still, oh, I'm telling you what, still the goodness, the salvation of this country is churches. And don't cities kind of amaze you that sometimes on one city block there's a there's a church on every corner on, on one block an intersection? Revivals, tent revivals, crusades, famed evangelists. We have no comprehension as like in the age of the evangelists of this country. If we backed up to Billy Sunday or we backed up to D.L. Moody, uh, we could back up to where they went when Billy Sunday preached in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The week that his revival was over in the tent, 200 saloons closed their doors. Just went out of business. We just don't hardly comprehend that anymore, do we? We don't know what it's like, even if we come up into the early 60s of Billy Graham preaching at Shea Stadium and 120,000 people come, an altar call just as I am, and thousands of people, thousands going forward to be saved. 
Our former pastor was saved listening to Billy Graham on TV and got under such conviction in a living room watching TV and Billy Graham that he prayed and him and his wife prayed and asked the Lord to save him. When have you heard that recently? You know. Billy Graham preached to over one million people in Seoul, uh, 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 Korea. Considered the largest gathering of people for an evangelistic meeting that was ever held. Actually, 1.1 million people. Can you imagine the sound system you have to have to broadcast to 1.1 million people? Invitation comes, one-tenth of the people responded. A hundred thousand people born again. I'm kind of in our age. If I backed up, which we went in, how many have ever drive, driven through southern Ohio and seen Oberlin College? You think that G, uh, Finney could go into that town into a factory and have such a spirit and power of God upon him? He went into a factory that was founded as a Christian college, too, and based on Finney's study, walked into the factory. And the factory horn sounded and whistled and the machinery stopped and men fell on their knees. And for the next several hours, people begged God to save them. And they closed the factory down for an invitation in the, because Finney visited the factory. And the college is found. Where do you hear stuff like that? George Whitfield. 230 some thousand miles by horseback going up and down the east coast here. Most of the old Methodist churches were founded by his work along. The, you can go right over here and see some of the things. Films are even built on it. And you can see the burial places. And, so, and preach and 30,000 people gather in the fields to hear that man speak. Kentucky was famous. For a great revival that broke out in the time of the pioneers of Daniel Boone and so like that. And the great brush arbor. People just gathering out in the woods. People gathering out in the field. Because the evangelist was coming through. And people. America's heritage. And of course. I looked and saw a little brief. In a, one of our new high school textbooks. A little thing about that big. About the. The Age of Enlightenment, and it was given credit to how America decided to sign the Declaration of Independence, and a little blurb about that big, and it said, because, because of the righteousness preaching of such men as Jonathan Edward and George Whitfield was sweeping the New England states and calling men to righteousness. But the big. People, if you live in the United States, someone's probably given you a gospel track. If you've lived in America, you've probably heard a radio broadcast. If you've lived in America and drove down 460, you saw somebody is putting up a sign that says, Repent and be born again. You can't get away from it. And by, by the way, about everywhere you travel, somebody has put up three crosses in a field. Why? Because in America, you've been close to the gospel. More so than anywhere else I know of in the world. And if it hasn't been just the country, and it hasn't been just the churches and the evangelistic outreaches, then maybe it's just been family. Thank the Lord if you've had the privilege of someone getting saved in your family. Especially first generation Tammy can be very thankful that her mama started listening to Oliver B. Green in the milking parlor. And at first, if you've ever heard Oliver B. Green preach, you must be born again. And if you send me a love offering of $100, I'll send you absolutely free 10,000 tracks. And are you sure? I don't think folks would hardly listen to him today. But, Tammy, you can be thankful that your mom started listening to him. All those years in a denominational church and never born again. So much so that her dad at first said, shut him off. He's upsetting the cows.
But I do remember that he said in his testimony, Vic said, I can be thankful that, that Patty led our family to Christ. She gave her credit. She kept that Rip Baines was preaching. She finally said, we're not saved. We need to go someplace that preaches what he's preaching. And they visited a church and got born again. Got cut off from the rest of all their other family for that because of leaving the denomination. Thank the Lord if you had someone first saved. I can't necessarily give it credit to our family, our blended family, and Poppy and Mom. We were not a Christian family, but I can give credit to a man named Ron Bowman, who is a good friend to Poppy, and said, there's a man speaking that I want you to hear. His name's Fred Brown, Evangelist Fred Brown from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I know we went to a revival service and heard that evangelist speak. No one got saved that night, but we went again the next night. We went again the next night, and by Sunday morning, I know this, Poppy and Mama walked the aisle to be born again. And I know about two weeks later, my brother Mike and I said to Poppy, we don't know what's happened to you, but we don't want to go to hell either. Amen? You can be thankful if somebody in your family has been a witness to you about being saved. That brought the gospel from America and churches into your living room or your bedroom or your kitchen table. And if your spouse got saved and she brought the gospel and said, now you sorry old sinner. If I love you, but if you die, you go to hell and we'll be separated for all eternity. You need to be saved. If you have a spouse that is witness to if you have, should I go the other way around? Maybe it's a papa. Maybe it's grandma and grandpa. Maybe it's kids. They went off to camp. Oh, okay, let's let the kids go to that church's Bible camp. Or let's let them go to that vacation Bible school. And them kids came home and all they knew is Jesus saves. They told us there that if we died without Christ, we'd go to hell. But if we asked Jesus to save us, we'd be born again. Mama, Papa, we want you to be saved. If you had that kid in your house, you can thank God the gospel was that close. Amen. And what a shame it would be to realize you don't have to go crawling up to the stars you don't have to be going out to the Pacific Ocean. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I'm a sinner, he's righteous. And believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead for the very purpose of my sins, God put his only begotten son on a cross to pay for my sins, died, buried, and raised him from the dead. If you will believe, thou shalt be saved. How close is it? It's right here. It's right where you sit. You can't get away from it. What did I used to say? Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. If you were the one who got closest to the stake, you could measure it out with the other horseshoe and say, you're the closest, you get a point. Hand grenades, you just got to be in the proximity and shrapnel will get something. But to be in heaven, you can't just be close. You have to be born again. And aren't you thankful that Jesus put it right here? Don't let possessions, don't let pride, don't let peer pressure have you leave sorrowful or almost persuaded. Call on Jesus Christ while he is near. Amen.
Let's close with a word of prayer. Can't help but wonder how many young people say, all those years I was so close, brought up in church, and missed it. Don't do that. Thank you for coming on this warm summer Sunday. Isn't it the delight to be in the Lord's house and just see how magnificent God's word can be? Brother Rick, I've never been born again. I've been close. Holy Spirit's knocked on my door, heart's door, several times. I've got someone in my family close with the gospel. I'm in church, close to the gospel. I'm in America, close to the gospel. Holy Spirit's in speaking, close to the gospel. Call on him today while he's nigh. Brother Rick, I need to be saved. Anybody like that? I pray with you for it. I don't know on summer Sundays that it won't be all but God's people in his house. Take that same gospel and take it to others. Just before we pray, I'll say this. Something good happened last Sunday. I mentioned about witnessing the loss and take some tracks. At the close of the second service, I walked back by the track table, and there were only four tracks left on it. I don't know who or how many, but somebody said, I'm going to take these tracks and witness to somebody. That was really good. Take that gospel and make it close for somebody. Give them a piece of paper that shows them how they can pray and ask the Lord to save them right where they're at. Holy Father, bless the church. May our hearts just be drawn to how wonderful it is to be saved and how you brought the gospel close to us. May we be instruments for others of the same thing. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.